Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really honoured to be here on this auspicious occasion commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Royal College, a college and an institution which we look up to so much uh, in Ireland and try to emulate. And to address this question, which the research priority exercises, which were mentioned earlier this morning, have uh, suggested that this question is among the top priorities for research and for engagement uh, by our anaesthesia community and indeed by, by our patients. Um, and so I'd like to begin, if I may, by introducing you to two cancer surgeons that I work with. You may recognise them, in fact, in your hospital, though they work with me. Here's one of them, <laughs> and here's the other. And this, of course, is how cancer surgeons are seen, quite rightly, in fairness, by <coughs> their patients, by all the healthcare and paramedical staff, and, of course, by themselves. And what would the role of anaesthesia be seen to be during cancer surgery? I mean, most people would agree it's probably important keeping the patient alive and well during the important cancer surgery. But what do they all think of me in Dublin, for example? <laughs> so why should anyone think differently? Well, we know that cancer is one of the top killers in the world. And in fact, uh, it's probably jointly number one cause of death now, along with cardiovascular diseases, and in some cases is exceeding cardiovascular deaths. And we know that most deaths from cancer are attributable to the spread of that cancer, to met metastatic disease. Rarely does the primary tumour kill our patients. And of course, surgery for many tumours is an essential treatment and always will be. Get the tumour out, debulk it. But inevitably, despite the best surgical technique in the world, many patients have invisible evidence of cancer spread right at the time of surgery. There are micrometastases at that time, and <laughs> these can even be boiled down to circulating tumour cells, individual invisible cells, which are inadvertently splashed into the local area around the site of surgery and into the circulation. And whether these circulating tumour cells just die from being cut off from the uh, mother tumour or are engulfed by the immune system and dealt with, or whether uh, worryingly they become, uh, they survive and thrive and multiply in a distant organ depends upon a number of factors going on in the perioperative period. So if you or I were a circulating tumour cell and we wanted to be good at our job, we would, have to do, we would have to do certain things. And despite all my messing at the interval, it just doesn't seem to be working. We'll try it one more time. OK, well, we just abandoned that 40 seconds. But essentially, for a circulating tumour cell to be any good, it needs to do certain biological things. It needs to proliferate, go forth and multiply, it needs to migrate or to move, and it needs to invade into adjacent tissues and then uh, to attract itself a blood supply. And whether or not that happens or whether indeed it is resisted by immune, the immune system or whether it simply dies out depends upon this balance of forces going on in the perioperative period. And they are between forces that tend to perhaps promote the chance of the cancer cell surviving and becoming a metastatic spread or in fact that being resisted. And the factors that promote cancer or metastatic spread include surgery per se. And this is well known for many decades that in fact the surgical handling of a tumour inadvertently leave some cells behind and causes a surgical stress response which impairs, transiently impairs the body's immune system. And then some of our general anaesthetic agents, but not all importantly, have been shown in laboratory models to promote or facilitate cancer cell spread. And we all know that pain is bad for us, but uh, Pain in the setting of cancer surgery seems to facilitate cancer spread. And there's really impressive laboratory animal models around that. And then the drugs that we often use as a default to treat post-operative acute pain, opioids, have themselves at least an experimental model question mark over them in terms of opioids' ability to facilitate cancer cell growth and development and potential for metastatic spread. And uh, recently then, anxiety, which of course is part and parcel of being a perioperative cancer patient, and the stress 
associated with that and associated uh, with the stress response to surgery seems to promote hormonal conditions that may facilitate cancer spread. So what's against that? What are the forces tending to resist cancer metastatic spread in the perioperative period? Well, our immune system is very important, in particular one aspect of innate or acquired immunity called natural killer T cells. And then there's mounting evidence that some of our drugs, particularly propofol, the IV general anaesthetic agent, and amide local anaesthetics themselves, apart from and in addition to regional anaesthetic techniques, may have beneficial effects on cancer cells. So if we have these forces going on, it doesn't take much imagination that if there's this balance of tumour promoting and tumour resisting forces going on in the perioperative period, and if some of the tumour promoting and anti-tumour uh, factors, if you will, are ranged against each other, then it doesn't take much imagination to come up with an anaesthetic technique or a bundle of anaesthetic techniques, which might include a regional anaesthetic, which as we know will attenuate the stress response to surgery, will, if it's working right, give excellent pain relief without opioids, and it might even reduce the MAC, the amount of volatile agents that we need to keep people unconscious. And if we use propofol rather than vapours, which have been suggested in certain levels of evidence to have a potentially beneficial effect, and even consider an infusion of local anaesthetics such as lidocaine, which are relatively safe, administered systemically, and have a lot of experimental evidence around their potential benefit, then it doesn't take much imagination to come up with an anaesthetic bundle of techniques which might potentially tilt the balance in favour of resisting cancer spread. So once again, to state that the journey going on from a cancer, from an ordinary cell, which for whatever reason becomes a cancer cell, grows uncontrollably to become a tumour, which delivers symptoms to the patient, so they present to us doctors who elicit signs, and with the help of special investigations, we determine a diagnosis of a surgical tumour for which surgery is indicated, and the surgery takes place with this inadvertent displacement of tumour cells. Whether they take root and become later metastasis depends upon this balance of forces going on in the perioperative period, some of which are at least potentially under the control of us anaesthetists at the top of the table. So that's a fine hypothesis, uh, you may think, uh, that the anaesthetic analgesic technique might affect cancer recurrence. You may well ask, well, what's the evidence? Well, it began, the journey I think began 10 years ago with the publication of some data from retrospective clinical data, flawed and inherently limited in its potential for interpretation from my own unit. But it did start a research journey. Uh, and the research journey is towards delivering prospective randomised control trials, which has as its primary outcome recurrence or metastasis. Do you have metastasis or recurrence from that primary tumour X years ago or not? And inevitably, that's a long journey. If I was to enrol the last patient in such a trial, in one such trial that I'm organising at the moment today, the study couldn't finish for five years because we have to follow up those patients for five years. So in the meantime, the, the anaesthesia community have been delivering cell culture evidence, some live animal model evidence, some retrospective clinical analysis, and then some translational studies, which I define as taking patients who are on prospective randomised trials and taking biological samples, typically blood samples or cancer tissue samples, and bringing them back to a laboratory model and experimenting on them. And they all seem to be adding up to a bit of a signal. Here is the original work from 10 years ago, which was a simple retrospective clinical study, whereby some patients from my unit who were having mastectomy for breast cancer received a propofol regional paravertebral regional anaesthetic technique and some patients received general anaesthesia with vapours and opioids. There was no randomization, it was down to things like convenience and available time. But we did find that the patients who had a propofol paravertebral anaesthetic seemed to have a longer disease-free survival compared to patients who had the standard uh, technique. Now such retrospective studies are inherently biased. All they can do is generate a hypothesis such as this. 
um, and this is the 10th anniversary. But I would put it to you, and I think uh, I could defend, even among sceptical colleagues, that the balance of evidence from the cell cultures, from the retrospective clinical studies, from the laboratory animal models suggests a signal that anaesthetic technique might indeed affect cancer outcome. But the only way we can prove it is to undertake prospective, randomised, multicentre controlled trials comparing bundles of anaesthetic techniques against each other with cancer recurrence or metastasis being the primary endpoint and so a long term follow up study is necessary. And these studies if we were to detect, say, an absolute risk reduction of 10%, that would be huge uh, for patients in terms of reducing risk of cancer recurrence. And, interestingly, it would be cheap because there is nothing experimental about the bundles of anaesthetic techniques that we're suggesting might be beneficial here. It could be implemented on a worldwide basis, rapidly, if it was adopted, at almost at negligible financial cost and importantly at, at negligible side effect profile cost because many of the new treatments wonderful as they are in oncology for example as we well know are associated with adverse side effects in some cases life-threatening a switch to different bundles of anaesthetic techniques which is the potential prize on offer here could be delivered at negligible economic and at negligible patient side effect cost but to determine such small changes as 10% uh, absolute risk reduction in cancer recurrences such as breast cancer, we need very large numbers of patients. I have 2,000 patients as of this month enrolled in such a breast cancer trial with some international partners, 500 of them in my own centre. But it's not enough because the incidence of breast cancer recurrence has halved in the interval since 2008 when we started this. And of course it needs big funding and we've delivered this on our own with no funding because funding bodies outside our specialty are astonishingly resistant to and sceptical of this hypothesis and evaluating it in properly funded trials. So if you have any influence over grant funding bodies, please use it because I would put it to you that this research question is as worthy as any other that is out there in the medical community um, in general rather than just as a specific self-interested uh, anaesthesia question. But it needs large-scale funding to deliver these randomised trials and they're the only way to address this question which I put to you is as important as any other for our profession and for our society. Thank you for your attention.